Jesus Christ. The name that is every other, above every other name. Yes, Lord. We worship you this morning. You are worthy of all the praise. You are worthy of all the glory, Lord. Ramaka sete libushaka haribose de mulla di cosa grazie. Kire bossa tala mande di cosa grazie. We give you praise, we worship you this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, give it to him for a little bit of 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 a little Thank you, thank you, praise and worship for such a wonderful, wonderful time that we had in the presence of the Lord. Saints, I welcome you all in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It is so great, it is so good to be in the presence of God. Amen. I always think, if you are not here, where would you rather be? This is the best place to be. Hallelujah. Amen. And I welcome you, I want to welcome Pastor, Pastor Owen, and uh, everyone else who is joining us here. And even those that are joining us from home, I welcome you all in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let us get straight into the word of God. Amen. Amen. But I think before I do that, let us pray quickly. Thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, yes, we Father. thank you, Lord, for this time that we have yes, to be in your presence. Yes, thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be called your children, oh, to be called by your name in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we are gathered here this morning to hear what you have to say to us. We know that one word from you, Lord, is able to change our lives for good. We thank you, Lord, for this gathering that we have. Thank you for the saints that are connected here and those that are connected at home in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for the spirit of understanding amongst your people. That is the word goes to them from you. Father, may they understand your will for their lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, this morning, I want to talk to you about a very important subject. And I want to ask you a few questions this morning before I start. How many ways are there to pray? When you pray, how do you do it? Is there a right and a wrong way to pray? And what happens when you pray? Does God really hear your prayers? And if he does, does he really answer your prayers? How sure are you? <laughs> now the message today is aimed at answering all these questions that you probably might have had in your mind for a while. And we are going to read, um, our scripture for today is taken from Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 6, from verse 5 to 8. And I think I'm going to put it up on the screen as well, as well for you. Now, in this passage, this is what is famously known as the Sermon on the Mount. And it starts from chapter 5, and it proceeds to chapter 6. Now we're in chapter 6, and we are just going to fo focus on this part of the Sermon on the Mount. These are the words of Jesus. He says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Yeah. Verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Hallelujah. Amen. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the patterns do. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Verse 8. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Hallelujah. Amen. Now one thing that I have learned through my recent studies of the word of God is that 
We always have to take particular care of the word of Jesus Christ. What did he say, really? These are the most important words in the Bible. The whole book is about one person, and his name is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, in the above text, the Lord Jesus Christ shows us that there are two ways to pray. The right way and the wrong way. Hallelujah. The right way and the wrong way. And this morning I'm going to start looking at the wrong way to pray. Or I'll call it the false way to pray. Now, in verse 2, Jesus here says, don't pray like the hypocrites do when you pray. You might ask yourself this question. What is a hypocrite? Who is a hypocrite? Now, a hypocrite is a person who puts on a false appearance of virtue or a false appearance of religion. Or it's a person who acts in contradiction to his beliefs. Or you can actually say a hypocrite is a fake person. You remember Paul talks about what he calls false brethren. We don't just hear false preachers, false uh, apostles, false prophets. They are also what are called false brethren. That are fake. Yeah. Now, in this text, Jesus was making a special mention to the Pharisees. This is, these are what he calls the, 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 the hypocrites. Now, who are the Pharisees? Isn't it interesting that if you go in the Old Testament, you will not find the word Pharisee. You will not find the word Sadducee. They are not there. Because uh, in the Old Testament, you probably have read that at one time, the Israelites were taken into captivity, into Babylon. At first they went into Assyria, then Babylon. They stayed there for 70 years. Then they came back. God brought them back into the promised land, into the holy land of Israel, after 70 years. And from that period to the time that Jesus came, it's a period of about 400 years. And this time is not in the Bible. This time, God is quiet. God is not talking. There is no prophet in Israel. There is no king in Israel. The Greek Empire came and it fell. The Roman Empire came and Jesus was born during the time of the Romans. And during these 400 years, that is when the Pharisees came. Who were they? They were part of this group that was called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was some kind of a, a council that was formed during that time to lead the people. Remember, they were not, they were not, not ruling themselves anymore. They were being ruled by the, by the Romans. But the Pharisees were a group of people that were sort of teaching the law. They were uh, in the tribunals, in the court system of Israel. And these people, because they were teachers of the, of the law uh, during this time that is normally referred to as the second temple period, they loved to be seen by people. They were the teachers of the law, like I said, and they loved to stand in the street corners when they prayed. So that everybody could see them. Now the big question is, why would Jesus have a problem with these people? You know what? God is more concerned about your heart more than your public display of religion. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on. God is interested in things like your heart, things like your motives, your reasons for doing what you do. Hmm. I remember when I started, when I, when, when I uh, joined Bible school and I was talking to Pastor Owen, I don't know if he remembers, his question to me was, why are you going to Bible school? <laughs> you want to sing in the choir? Why? You want to be in ministry? Why? You want to serve in the church? What is your motive? This is what God is interested in. And this is what Jesus had an issue with when it regards to, to the Pharisee. Actually, when you check Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, uh, he says that, I'm going to read from the NIV. I know that it's in the King James Version there, but he says in the NIV, 17, 10 of Jeremiah, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. 
He examines the heart. You know, you cannot fool God. You can never fool God. Now, hypocrites like to be seen by people when they pray. Jesus Christ calls you not to do that. Never pray so that people can see you. We see this sometimes in the body of Christ when we pray. You know, sometimes a person can be called up here up front to pray for things like the offering or to pray for the sick or, 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 or stuff like that. And you can tell. You hear somebody say something like when he's praying for offering, oh, great father. <laughs> this is the propitiation of the expression of our propensity to your love. <laughs> we are so flabbergasted by your love towards us, your offspring. And you wonder, is it the same person? Because he doesn't talk like this every day. It is absolutely disgraceful to God to pray to pray like that. Amen. Sometimes people like to pray where everyone can see that they are praying. And the motive is so that people can see. You use all these big words. Why? So that people can hear. And Jesus Christ clearly explains that if you do that, you have received your reward in full. Now, you know what is the reward? The praise of men. Yes. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. When people look at you and say, wow, that's a prayer. That is a reward. <laughs> You see, now that is bad. Brethren, our Lord Jesus Christ calls us not to do anything to get praise from men. Oh, yes. I would rather get no praise from men as long as I get praise from God. Hallelujah. Amen. His praise, his opinion is what really matters. Come on. Not your pastor's opinion. Yes. Not your wife's opinion. Not your brethren's opinion. But the opinion of God. Amen. Hallelujah. That is the first thing. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a fake Christian. A fake brethren. False brethren. Hallelujah. Amen. The second thing that Jesus talks about here in this passage, he says, do not pray like the pagans. Don't pray like the pagans. Now, who are the pagans? You have heard about this word before. Now, if you check in the Old Testament, you won't find the word pagan. You will find the word hidden. Hidden. In the New Testament, it's pagan, but sometimes you find hidden as well. But it says, don't pray like the, like the pagan. Now, the word pagan is taken from a Greek word in this passage that is called ethnicos. Ethnicos. Now, who are these pagans? Now, pagans referred or refers to people that were foreigners to Israel. They didn't know the God of Israel. Hallelujah. They were into idol worship. And sacrifices were a key part of their religion. I come from that region myself. Maybe some of us here probably do. Apart from Israel, the whole world were pagans. In Africa, in America, in India, in Europe, everyone was into pagan worship because we didn't know God. We didn't know the God of Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I took a come from the same background because my grandfather, on my paternal grandfather, he was a spirit medium, African traditional priest. So you know how pagans worship, they have these feasts that they have from time to time. And what happens during these feasts is that there has to be a spirit medium. So they sing and they pray and they, and they do all these chants and dances so that when they've done it enough, the spirit of whoever, the great grandfather or whatever, descends on this person and then he begins to speak to the tribe or begins to speak to the people at that time. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, um, that is pagan worship. And you see, in pagan worship, there are a lot of, lot of chants. Chants, these repetitive chants that they do. Enchantments. Now, probably some of us here are involved in that as well. And you see, in pagan worship, Practices. Normally people do these enchantments and these repetitive chants. And Jesus Christ says, no, when you pray, don't pray like the pagans. Because if you come from the same background like that, you might want to bring that into the church. Mm. And to make matters worse, we do have some Christians as well who come to church on Sunday, but then during the week, 
They are consulting Sangomas. Thank you know you. what I'm talking about. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> they are some Jewel, Jewel religion people. And they bring these practices into the church. And Jesus Christ says, no, don't do that. Don't, when you pray, don't make these repetitions, the vile repetitions that are meaningless. You find a Christian praying something like, do it, Lord, do it, Lord, do it, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord. He said, you are playing. There's nothing you are doing. Hallelujah. Don't use vile repetitions. And when you pray, speak to God like he's a real person. Speak to God like you talk every day. Hallelujah. He is a person. He is not some mysterious being that doesn't have a personality. He has got feelings. He has got ears to hear. Come on. Imagine if your son, your child, at home, he wants school fees from you. And he comes to you and he says, Oh, Father, wow. Lion of the house. <laughs> if only you could just give give me school fees, Father. From today onwards, I'll be a very obedient. Would you would you like that? <laughs> and you look at the person, you wonder, is this is this a person? He's a totally different person. Don't ever think that God will hear you because you are loud. Or because you repeat your words over and over again, like the pagans do. Hallelujah. Come on. Talk to him like he is close. Remember, he lives in the inside of you. Yeah. You can actually say, Good morning, Holy Spirit. Come on. Thank you that you are with me this morning. Oh, yes. I'm going to work now. Yeah. I know you are with me. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. After work, thank you, Holy Spirit. Yeah. That day was so good. I know you by my side. Thank you. If something went wrong, talk to him. Father, I, I need that job. Oh, Father, I need ABC. You know, you talk to him like you talk every day. Mm. Hallelujah. Come on. This is the wrong way to pray. Don't pray like a hypocrite. Don't pray like Parkinson. Now, we have looked at the wrong way to pray. I want us to look at the right way to pray according to the words of the Master himself. Now, if you check verse 6, Jesus says, when you pray, go into your closet when you pray. You see, personal prayer is your private relationship with God. It is your opportunity to meet with Him privately. And since it's a private matter, you should find a quiet place where you can pray. Now, uh, your, your closet doesn't necessarily have to be a private room that you can lock. Because sometimes you don't have that. It just needs to be a place where you can just be alone with God. Hallelujah. So it's not really a room, person, because you can be in the room again, but you are so full of yourself and less of God. You are not, you are not alone. That's not a private room. And in this principle here, Jesus is teaching us two things. The first thing is that your prayer life is a private matter between God and you. It's a private affair. And number two, your prayer life should never be publicly flaunted to impress men with your spirituality. But Jesus is not saying that we shouldn't pray. Like if you are called to pray up here. No, 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 he's not saying that you shouldn't do that. No, you can't do that. But if you are given an opportunity to pray in front, to sing in front, to worship in front, don't use that as an opportunity to impress people with your skills, to impress people with your vocabulary, to impress people with your words. That's an opportunity for you to speak to God during the meeting. Hallelujah. Amen. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, this is a sure promise from God. There is a reward when you pray like that. That is the first thing. Secondly, as we look at the right way to pray, remember that your father knows what you need before you ask him. He is God, you know. He knows everything. He knows you. He knows your thoughts. He knows your heart. And remember, when you pray, you are not praying to a dead God. We are praying to the living God who is not only alive, 
but he is life itself. Amen. He knows everything, including, including the things that you need and the things that you haven't asked for yet. He knows what you're going to ask for in December 2020. Come on. 2021. <laughs> you see? So perhaps you may ask. So if God already knows what I want, what I need, why do I need to ask him? Maybe that's the question you ask. You know, I, I'm, I'm amazed that Christians who think that they've got questions for God. You know Christians who say that? When they see God, I, I need him to answer these questions. I actually have a lot of questions. That question and that question. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, when you see him, you won't ask anything. <laughs> that's how big he is. You just stand there and say, yes, sir. Everything that he says, yes, sir. Remember John? Yeah. Yes, sir. But you see, if you're asking that question this morning, why do I have to tell him what I need when he already knows what I need? Why do I have to do that? You see, that should tell, him, tell you that what he's more interested in is a relationship. Come on. Come on now. More than the gift he gives you. Come on. The relationship between you and him, that's what matters to him. Sure. Now, how do we create that relationship with God? How do we commune with God? Now, if you remember, we were doing Bible study a few weeks ago. There was a session that we spoke about communion with God. There are two ways that we commune with God. Who remembers, for those of you who were, who were in the Bible studies? Pastor, you see, the people here, they did not in Bible study. <laughs> there are two ways that you commune with God. Number one is through prayer. Number two is through studying the scriptures. That's what is more concerned with, more than giving you gifts and all that. Now, take for example, many parents who could be here this morning. How nice is it for us to do things for our children when we have a relationship with them? No parent wants a transactional relationship with a child. We all want to be close to our children. And when we are close to them, we love doing things for them. God loves it when we talk to him, when we make an effort to cultivate a relationship with him. Hallelujah. Amen. This should be the number one priority. Pastor Owen, when he preaches here, most of the time he always talks about to be Christ-like, to be close to Christ. It has to be all about Christ, all about our relationship with Christ. Amen. Now, I want to get a third point here as we talk about the right way to pray. Now, this point, you don't get it from the passage that I spoke about. You get it from Mark chapter 11, verse 24. And here, Jesus was teaching about the same subject of prayer. And in Mark 11, 24, he says, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. That is the third point. So my third point is, when you pray, believe. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Yeah. It's not about tears, you know. It's not about crying. Yeah. You can cry and cry for as long as there's no faith. That doesn't move God. Yeah. God is moved by faith. Do you believe when you pray? Now, you probably know that the New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in mainly Hebrew and Aramaic. But I want us to look at the, so you see, these translations that we have, the King James, the NIVs, and so on, were translated from these original manuscripts, okay, that are still there today. So, I want us to look at this verse again, Mark chapter 11, verse 24, from the original manuscript, or the, the original Greek. What does it say to read, and what do those words mean? I will repeat the scripture again. It says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received and it will be yours. Now, let's look at these words. The first word I want to look at is the word ask. Now, the Greek word that is used there is translated to say, to mean uh, a believer who keeps on asking repeatedly, possibly over some time. You see, so it's not just asking once. You can ask today, you can ask tomorrow. You can keep on asking. Now, I know theologians who say that uh, uh, if you have faith, you only pray once. Ever heard that? Yeah. Because they say if you pray once, if you pray again for the same thing, it shows that you didn't have faith. 
No, that is not correct. That's not the correct interpretation of the Bible. The word ask here from the Greek translation, it gives a picture of someone who asks again and again and again. You know that scripture that says that knock and the door shall be opened. Ask and it shall be given. The word ask there and the word knock there, they mean continue knocking. Continue asking and the door shall be opened. So you can ask today, you can ask tomorrow, you can keep on asking repeatedly over some time. That is okay. Now, let's look at the second word, which is believe. Because it says, when I, uh, therefore I tell you, whatever I ask for in prayer, believe. What is the word believe? The word believe, it comes from the Greek word pisteo, which means, at this point, you stop asking. Now you believe. What do you believe? That God has answered your prayer. You see, so I pray on Monday, I probably pray on Tuesday or on Wednesday for as long as the burden is in me to pray. But at this point, I stop praying. I start believing. What do I believe? That he has answered the prayer. So this is ongoing belief. But the thing I'm praying for hasn't manifested itself yet in the physical. This is how spirit, spirit law, or spiritual law works. Do you remember one time when the disciples of Jesus and Jesus were going to a certain place? They passed through a certain area. And Jesus was hungry. And he got to the fig tree. And he was looking for figs and he didn't find the figs. Do you remember that story? What did Jesus do? Who remembers? What did Jesus do? Yes. He cursed the tree. Thank you. Well done. He cursed the tree. But you know what happened there? Nothing happened to the tree. I'm sure the disciples who were there wondered, what is wrong with him? He's talking to a tree. And they proceeded. But then tomorrow when they came back along the same way, what had happened to the tree, young lady? Do you remember? Yes. The tree was dried up from the roots. That's what the Bible says. Which means from the moment that the word was given, there is something that started to take place there. That's what happened to the prayer. When you pray with belief, you may not see the sign immediately. But something is happening in the spirit. Hallelujah. Before you know it, it will manifest in the physical. That's how spiritual law works. So when you say believe, you stop asking. At this point, you don't ask anymore. You believe now. It's like ongoing belief. It's abiding confidence. Let's look at the third word. So the scripture says, when you pray, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it. Let's look at the word received. Now, the word received, it comes from a Greek word called lambano. Now, lambano, it's, uh, you haven't received this thing as yet. But what happens is, you, in the physical, but you have received it in the spirit. It's like taking hold of, of something in, in your spirit. Which means even my language changes, you know. It's very easy to see if a Christian believes or not. You know what you do? You listen to how he talks. The words that come out of his mouth. Which means if you are constantly complaining about whatever you've been praying, praying for, you actually don't believe that God answered your prayer. Because if I believe that he answered my prayer, it means from this point onwards, my language changes. I begin to talk as if God has already answered, because he has already answered my prayer. Hallelujah. Yes. I'm no longer complaining. I'm now praising God. In fact, that is the last, the last one. It says, will be yours. It's the word esomai. That's the future tense. Now, esomai, it kind of implies that I prayed for something here. I believed for it here. But then I haven't received it in the physical. Then at some point, it's going to come. Now, I am believing that it is mine, that it will come. That you see, from the point that I prayed and the point that I received physically, it means there might be a time gap here. It might take as long as God wants. But in this period between when I pray and when I receive, my faith needs to be working. At this point, I receive that thing. Hallelujah. I'm no longer complaining on this journey. I am believing what Jesus said. In fact, I want to summarize this, this point that I've just said now in terms of prayer. How do we reconcile this, Mark chapter 11 verse 24, with Jesus teaching about perseverance in prayer? 
I have three points I want to mention here. So, children of God, when we pray, it's three things that we need to do. Number one is petition. Everybody say petition. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, what is petition? Effective prayer it begins with a God-given burden. You don't just pray. God places the burden on your heart. Then you begin to pray. Now, when you pray, you ask, like I mentioned. Maybe you are asking. You are praying earnestly for as long as that burden is there. It means that you may have to travail for some time, praying for that thing over some time. You are praying, you are petitioning God, you are seeking His face. There is this thing that you want. You, you, you keep on praying, you keep on praying. That is the first part. Now, I'm done praying. You know what happens? The second part, or oh, part number B, is peace comes. Because when I pray and He answers, I get peace in my heart. Yeah. At this point, the burden lifts and God's peace enters my heart. The Holy Spirit himself gives me assurance in me that I have received whatever that I was asking for or whatever that I was praying for. I don't have the answer itself as yet, but I have the inner assurance that God has answered. Come on. Hallelujah. Yes. And at this point, my prayer tone, it changes. I'm no longer asking. I'm no longer begging. I begin to. Number three, praise. Everybody say praise. praise. You see, I feel now I begin to praise God. Yeah. I thank you, Father. Thank you that you answered my prayer. Yeah. Thank you, Lord, that that thing is mine. Thank you that I am flourishing in my ministry. Thank you that the gifts of God are flourishing in me. That is your prayer. Hallelujah. Now, when the bird is lifted and the Lord's presence has come, you stop praying and praising. So we should persevere in these faith-filled prayers until God gives us an answer. And the answer is usually an inner assurance of the Holy Spirit that God has answered my prayer. Hallelujah. Amen. This is how we want to go. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. I want to conclude this morning. Brothers and sisters, as we have seen from the passage above, there are two ways to pray. Which way and which way? No. Yes, Captain? No. Wrong way. Wrong way. Go ahead. Well done. <laughs> the wrong way and the right way. Hallelujah. And I believe that Jesus is answering, or rather is challenging us this morning to pray correctly. And we should pray in the right way. Look into your heart when you pray. Why do you do the things that you do? Why do you pray the way that you are praying? Are you praying like a hypocrite? Are you praying like a pagan? Or you are praying like a spirit-filled child of God? Choose the right way this morning. Hallelujah. Don't pray like a hypocrite. Don't be a fake Christian. Don't pray to be seen by people. But pray to be seen by God. To be answered by God. Because it's only Him whose opinion really matters. Pray like a child of God. Get yourself in your closet when you pray. Where it's just God and you. And talk to your father who sees in secret. Do not pray to be seen by people. But rather pray to commune with God. And when you pray, believe in your heart that God hears your prayers. Because he really does hear prayers. Hallelujah. You know, this is the word of God. And at this point, I want to call all of us this morning. Can you just rise on our feet? These are the words of the Master. The words of Jesus Christ Himself. I want us to get into a time of prayer for two, three minutes. And as we pray, I want you to forget about anyone who is next to you. Forget about the preacher. Forget about anyone. You might close your eyes and help. So you can focus on your master. I want you to tell him what is in your heart. The concerns of your heart. What is it that you require? That's what he's saying this morning. What do you want? Like that leper that was on the, on the, on the well. 
on the pool. He asked, what do you want? That's what he's asking you this morning. You don't even scream. Talk to him. What do you want? Let us pray. Talk to him. Tell him what is in your heart.